Hello, welcome. I'm Roger Royce with the 10,000 Startups Podcast, where every week we bring you new original content on issues relating to the law around startups. This week, we have, we're have we going to take a little bit of a different approach. Uh, this is certainly around the law around startups, but you might call it the, the, the future law or where the law is going or what's happening in, in law and technology. And I'm just really excited to have as a guest here, Patry Friedman, um, who some of you probably know from, from years ago, the Seasteading Project. Uh, but Patry, is a, uh, he's, a, he's got a master's in computer science from Stanford. He was an engineer at Google. Uh, he started several other projects we're going to talk about. He's currently with Pronomus Capital, if I'm pronouncing that right, as well as the Future Cities uh, Project. And uh, also, uh, here's an interesting fact I picked up just today from Wikipedia. Uh, one of the uh, one of the top rated poker players in the world at one time uh, predicted to be uh, the winner of the World Series uh, by by some media about 20 years ago. Uh, but I guess you've decided to gamble on startups now <laughs> instead of poker, huh? <laughs> it's it's much better. It's a much better way to gamble because it's uh, it's positive sum and creates value. Yeah. So let, let me uh, kind of jump right into, I guess, what, what I think you're most well known for is the Seasteading Project. It was just all over the media. It was such an ambitious, futuristic uh, idea. And again, this is 10,000 Startups as it relates to law. And you, in effect, had, had I don't know if you found a loophole in the law or if you just found a way to create your own law out in the middle of the ocean. But can you I don't tell believe folks- in loopholes. What's that? I don't believe in loopholes. So tell me about seasteading. How what what was that about? How does that intended to work? Sure. Yeah, it's a big topic, but I can I'll, I'll talk about my motivation and then the legal aspect. So my motivation is thinking that government needs a startup sector. That's how technology advances. And I think government is a technology. The laws and institutions, they're things that we design and tinker with to try to get what we want, try to get a good society. And without being able to try new things, uh, then we're not gonna advance. And so looking for a startup sector for government, back then in the 2000s, governments weren't really willing to work with companies to do governance experiments. Um, Dubai had not yet launched the DIFC. We didn't have Paul Romer in his charter cities idea. And so I looked to the ocean, first off, because it's the next frontier. And often legal experiments are done on the frontier. I mean, that's what happened with America, which you know I think of as, as an experiment that worked so well that it set the kind of the industry standard form of government, our constitutional representative, you know, democracy. But there's not really a way to do that now. And one thing that's really interesting about the ocean, you know, people people always think that my that I'm taking advantage of like, there's no law on the high seas or something, which is which is not true at all. But admiralty law works in this really cool way where every ship has to register with a country and fly its flag. And when that ship is out in international waters, it's that country's law that applies. And this is because, you know, a ship might travel all around the world. And so it can't just be tied geographically to some law. And so instead, it's this virtual association that can be changed each year, essentially franchising the country's sovereignty to each of these ships. And so that's a really different market than for governance on land. It's a competitive market where you can, you know, you just need to find one country in the whole world that says, okay, here's the division of responsibilities. You get to set laws on this. We get to set laws on this. Uh, You only need to find one of them. And then you're good when you're in international waters. So it's, you know, if we could do that on land, if like every town just had to like register with some state in the US or, you know, every province with some country and they could like change it each year, then, you know, we'd, we'd have much more flexible and, and responsive and innovative governance. So in a way, it was sort of like allowing people to elect in. Uh, regardless exactly. of where they were to elect into the government system that and, and it made government sort of competitive, I suppose. Exactly. That's you know the one of the major themes of my work. One of them is um it's looking at government 
governance like an industry and government like a company and making it more competitive. And then the other is looking at law like software code. Yeah. Now, wasn't it another aspect of this? Because at that time, and even today still, I mean, immigration in the U.S. is a little bit of a mess. Uh, and there's always dislocations. There's shortages of farm workers, et cetera. I mean, it seemed to me from where I was sitting as that was the problem you were solving. But what you described was a much different problem. Yeah, so that was actually a, a company, Blue Seed, started by one of my employees, or two of my employees, Max and Dario. Actually, um, Max lives here in Austin, so I've gotten to where I've just moved, so I've gotten to catch up with him. But that was what they were doing, is trying to bring software engineers close uh, in a boat. And there are actually some special laws about boats. So you could do something where a ship comes into port and people don't get off. Uh, and they're not subject to U.S. immigration because, you know, a ship that goes from here to China and back, like it, its employees don't need visa visas as long as they don't get off the boat. And so there's something you could do, whether it's by anchoring it out there or even bringing it in periodically and people could go in the boat for meetings. Uh, I, I, to me, the issue with that is value density. So the ocean is just it's really, really expensive. And in order to um, in order to make something work, you need to have like a big dollars per square foot per day reason to be there. And when I was working on starting a, a seasteading company, um, my partner and I were looking at medical tourism, do you know, doing procedures on a cruise ship because the you know dollars per square foot per day is really high. And having a programmer live there full time, um, you know that. If you look at maybe a, you can get a hundred thousand a year in the U.S. programmer for twenty thousand a year. That's so that's like eighty thousand per year per one person li living amount of space. But if you're doing hip, or if you do a hip replacement a week, you know at twenty five thousand, then that's twenty five thousand and fifty. That's like five hundred thousand for one person of space per year. And so those value that value densities are just really key like because life on the ocean is so expensive. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so the concept behind seasteading then, the idea that you could basically franchise government, it leads quite elegantly into this next project, the future cities development and what you've done down in Honduras. Because in effect, that that is pretty much the concept be, behind, I call it governance as a service. I think you've got a better catchier title for it. Uh, where where organizations, groups of people can come together and in an Atlas Shrugged kind of model, they can basically elect into the legal systems that they want. Am I describing that anywhere close to accurate? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a bit different in that, well, it can end up being the same. So, uh, you know, on the ocean, you in theory get the laws of that country, but because you're not taking any of their land and, the, and you're far away, they'll pro they're probably willing to let you um, have a lot of autonomy and create a lot of your own laws. And so what charter cities are, like the Honduran program, it's where a host country passes laws to work in public private partnerships with companies who set up and run a city on empty land. So it's pure opt-in. We're not changing the law over anyone. Only people who move in and want to be there are there. And then that company, I mean, they could copy the laws of, of another company. Or they could do what, uh, what our company Prospera did, which is they looked around the world at the best legal codes for a whole variety of different things. And they put together their own thousands of pages long commercial law system based on British common law, but picking the best parts from jurisdictions all over the world. So you can think of it as like, you know, the, the best of the best legal system, like who has the best commercial law, who has the best contracts law, who has the best tort law, um, who has the best family law. And just by putting together the best from around the world, and then there is quite a bit of work to kind of reconcile. It's like you're taking, you know, code from different programs for the same purpose, uh, maybe written in different languages and trying to get it to all run within the same program. So there's some work there. But you can have some place that's a better jurisdiction than anywhere in the world because it uses the best legal code for each thing that it does. 
Yeah, so just for the listeners and the viewers, Prospera is the sort of like a city state off near Honduras. Basically. No, it's not a city state because it's not a state. It's under Honduran sovereignty. Um, but it's a city with a, a strong amount of autonomy. It gets to write its own commercial law while following the Honduran constitution and treaties and criminal law. How's it doing? Um, has it been able to attract some high tech companies? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in fact, I'm I'm going in less than two weeks. I'm going there to get my genes edited to make me younger and stronger. So that's 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 pretty high tech. That's the future. Since uh, commercial law includes medical regulations, and they write their own medical regulations, so they're doing great. There's about a hundred people living there right now, and another ninety apartments opening in the coming months. Uh, Five hundred people are there working each week. Uh, over a thousand jobs created, including off-site and it you know just keeps growing and growing you know unfortunately the um the government that came into power two years ago sees it as you know um sees it as a negative for the country when you know the whole reason the program was created at this point 12 years ago was as a way of bringing in foreign direct investment creating jobs and bringing prosperity to the country i i think of this as a, a charter city, it's like a new development strategy where most of the old ways of trying to encourage development, like loans, haven't worked. And the idea here is that disparities in prosperity, like a huge cause, is things like corruption or what the legal system is. You know, a country where it takes a year and 27 permits to start a business. We shouldn't be surprised if they're economically behind. And so instead, normally the solution is migration, is people who leave their home country, go to a country with less corruption and better laws, and make a lot more money there within that system. But we think that it's better to bring those great laws and honest courts to countries so that people can live under them and have prosperity without having to leave their homelands. And so I, I, I think it's, it's also a human interest thing. And it's, it's my way to address the migration crisis. People don't want to leave their homes, most of them. And if they don't need to for economic opportunity, they won't. And so I think that's just good for everyone. Is this happening in other parts of the world or is it just Honduras? Um, Prospera and, and its, its sister Zetas, they're the only ones in the world that are operating but there are, you know, I, I'm working with a number of other countries on similar programs and have invested in uh, a number of companies. And, you know, it's kind of a race right now to see who will be number two. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's sort of like special economic zones on steroids in a way, isn't it? Because you're really kind of making, yeah. giving them everything they need to be super successful. And it sounds like Prospera has really done well with biotech. Is what I'm yeah. Hearing. I mean, I, I think of it, it is the next evolution of the special economic zone. It's it's really different in that it's, you know, SEZs are pretty shallow reforms, some tax breaks, tariff breaks, minor legal changes. And a charter city is, hey, let's take a whole big chunk of the legal system and hand it over to the, the company to do it its own way in its city. But it is still the same idea. It's it's a special jurisdiction used to promote innovation and, and prosperity. and you know, after what Dubai did with DIFC, we can kind of think of it as the current, you know, best of breed SZ technology is this, uh, you know, much more local autonomy over regulations. Gotcha. So what else is, are you working on? What else is Pronomus Capital looking at uh, other than this? I know it's generally governance. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's mostly these companies, the, the majority, um, and, and after Prospera, the other, uh, the other fastest growing ones are, are mostly in Africa. So that's a big, a big focus for us. But we also in, invest in, in a, a small number of other things that aren't this charter city model. And, uh, you know, uh, one of them is, is this company Metropolis, um, which you have some familiarity with. That's, that's yes, how I do. We <laughs> and, you know, there it's because uh, I'd worked with one of the co-founders, Martin, for five years now. He just, he fully gets the vision. We're, you know, we're very much brain brothers. And this um, 
program that we're really close to, to getting past in Palau, it just so fits my law as code thesis. It's so right down my alley. I uh, decided to invest, even though it's not starting out on land. And that what they're doing is this amazing thing, the, the Palau X corporations, which is where you have an offshore corporate registry that instead of making up its own body of corporate law, you can, in, you can incorporate there using the laws of Delaware and not a copy of the laws of Delaware, which is what Dubai did. They copied the laws of London, modified them a bit, and now they have their own, but directly referencing the laws of Delaware, just like you'd import a software library. And it makes all the sense in the world. Like why should, because law is open source. Anything that's not a secret hidden policy, all laws are published. They're published openly. And that's what makes them open source. So you can just refer to laws, whether or not you're in that country, whether or not you have access to their courts. And I just, I think it makes all the sense in the world for a small jurisdiction to just use the best law, just use Delaware corporate law in your own registry. And it's so powerful because just like you can port, uh, you can port an application from one server to another, right? As long as it kind of supports the same tech stack. Well, now you could port a corporation from Delaware to Palau, keeping all of your corporate documents, all of your board resolutions. You know, it's it's all the same. Or maybe you're incorporating something new, a new startup, but you get to use all the papers you're you're used to. You can use Safe Notes and you know Series C and all the standard docs. So I think it's just an incredible idea. Well, and the timing's right. I mean, it, it, we're, we're due for a reboot as to how that all works. I mean, there was a time when we would all set up companies in Cayman or BVI or, you know, all over the world to take advantage. Cayman especially had just a very friendly corporations code, very similar to ours, uh, but it's gotten to be, they, they now have an economic uh, presence, re, economic stuff, substance requirement that makes it almost impossible, unless you're a venture fund, to form there. So there's opportunities for other parts of the world to step in and fill the void and maybe do it a little bit better this time around. You know, what I didn't hear you say in any of that was that it's decentralized. I guess that's not really a big part of this because I used to hear law as code and that's what people meant. Mm. They wanted to decentralize it, but that's not essential to your model, I take it. No, that's, yeah, it's not what, it's not what I mean. I, I, I mean, for example, the fact that you can treat all of the published laws out there as this open source set of libraries and whether it's importing Delaware corporate law like the library as Metropolis is doing, or whether it's Prospera going and saying, what's the best you know, corporate law, what's the best mortgage law all around the world and putting them together. Like when things are open source, we can fork them, which is what Dubai did for DIC. They forked London, um, London commercial law. We can remix them in these different ways. And, you know, that's incredible. And it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be decentralized. It can be, uh, you know, a traditional nation state that's doing it. But I think of law as this, as an infrastructure layer. It's this core thing that makes a society work, but it's different from physical infrastructure. Like it is virtual, right? You can't just use a new power system. You can't just you know, using new telecommunications that you got to like lay wires or like or pipes for things. Whereas law, it's literally it's it's a shared agreement. So it's, you know, a bit in a database or a signed contract that says what law applies to a given region. So I think that we could be experimenting and remixing and treating law a lot more like code than we do. Uh, and, you know, that's why I'm so excited about these projects, which are doing that because code makes progress way faster than than law does and the difference does not have to be that that big yeah and and it and it makes sense that you're doing this in the developing world as well you mentioned africa uh or <clears throat> there's it seems to me there's probably it's probably easier to, to disrupt the infrastructure in law just like in other things in places like that maybe more receptive to the idea yeah, they, they are very receptive. And like, you know, the the, the capital costs are so much low, lower there. You know, a, a dollar goes a lot further towards actually building something. And they're still urbanizing and their population is still growing. So the number of, you know, of, of home, residents of cities is going up at something like 20 million a year. So for other types of charter cities, you have to say, okay, who will live here and how do we convince them? 
how do we make it, you know, enough better? Uh, you know, and Prospera has plenty of Hondurans who, who want to live there, but you still have to, you have to attract them. In Africa, they're just, they're, they're moving to cities already. Um, and so it's, you know, it's just, a, it's a lot better for a lot of reasons. Gotcha. Okay, we're running up against time, but I don't, I don't want to let, let you go without, I got to ask you, I didn't even know about this till this morning, the ephemeral, ephemeral, is that Ephemeral, because it's an ephemeral, ephemeral. island. Ephemeral sounds really interesting. Inspired by Burning Man, I understand. What yeah. is that? <laughs> so it was actually um, the original form of it. It was actually my idea kind of before seasteading or at the very beginning, which was I want us to try out really new legal systems and find things that work way better. But before anybody's going to go live full time under a new legal system, it needs to be tested. Like you test new software before you just run it live on your servers. And so what if there, what if we could go for a week every year and actually live under a specific different legal system and just try it for a week, like an art experiment, like people do with Burning Man. Uh, and so I thought of, you know, going to near shore international waters. Uh, this was back in 2002, I think that I, that I proposed this. And then when the CSA Institute got funding from Peter Thiel in 2007, we were actually able to launch the first one in 2009 in the Sacramento Delta region. So it's it's like a Burning Man on the water. It's a festival, uh, but not just of art, but of decentralized governance because it's it's a raft up where different ships and barges and platforms tie up together into islands. And so each island has its own rules. There's you know islands where you have to be clothed, and you know I haven't seen one, but there could be an island where you have to be naked. Um, you know, hmm. islands have very different policies about life preservers, um, media. Most islands won't take media. Uh, some years ago, a Japanese public television was was filming some stuff on me and they came to Ephemeral and none of the big islands would let them film there. And so they found a, they did they did the, you know, the founder thing. They found a local who had a boat and an island, like a small, like floating dock island, and they made their own island. And people just came there to get interviewed. So <laughs> it's 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 beautiful. Um, had an experience one year where kind of had a falling out with the people on the island um, where we were living early on. And so we, you know, my family and I, we we detached. We went to a different island and, and all was well. So uh, vote with your boat. Now, we kind of intended that. We do it in the in the in the calm waters of the Sacramento Delta. Then we do it in the San Francisco Bay, and then near shore, and then international waters. And you know, 15 years later, it's still in the same place. Um, so it makes sense that that part is harder, but it's still a really special, important thing. And I'm getting within the next few years, I expect to do the first international one, uh, probably in the in the Caribbean. Well, I'm going to be watching for that because that does sound fun um, and interesting. Come on down. Anytime. It's not far from the Bay. All right. Well, hey, Patra, I really want to thank you for being here today and giving us your time. I know you're a busy guy and you're doing a lot of big things. I'm sure we're going to be hearing about these projects in the future. Uh, so again, thanks for being here on our 10,000 Startups podcast. This is Roger Roy's 10,000 Startups Legal Strategies for Startup Success. I've been talking with Patra Friedman from Honomus Capital. Thanks, Roger.